Good afternoon and welcome back to another edition of the Mindset Go Radio Show. And I am your host, Mark Altman. Thrilled to be back here on a Thursday afternoon. And hope you're all having a great week. And today, as I was driving in, I was thinking to myself, what would be a great topic to discuss in the area of communication? And, you know, it's funny, I've mentioned this before. Uh, I'm the founder and uh, lead trainer at Mindset Go, and we often talk about, you know, why companies hire us, whether it be for consulting or training or coaching or even speaking. And regardless of the reason, it always, always comes back to an area of communication that needs to be developed or is falling short. And uh, for those of you who are regular listeners to the show, you know one of my greatest passions in life, aside from communication and helping others, is sports. And a uh, big sports fan, I've been a freelance sports writer for the better part of the last 20 years, working with Associated Press. And uh, one of my favorite things, I love watching sports, I love playing sports, I love coaching sports, and the leadership aspects that are involved. And I developed a program a while back um, and I do a lot of work with the MIAA and different workshops and programs. And I developed a program for coaches and student athletes around leadership. But the, the primary area of the program is to really understand how people react in various situations and the messages that those reactions can create. And the idea is that sports in so many ways is a metaphor for life. So the idea is to get people to use the skills that they need to be successful in sports and apply and see how those same skills could be impactful in life. And I'm talking about body language, reading it, interpreting it, responding to it, demonstrate it. I'm talking about your word choice and tone. I'm talking about your active and reflective listening skills. I'm talking about your resilience and dealing with disappointment and frustration. I'm talking about perseverance and determination, dealing with rejection, so on and so forth. So as I was coming in today, I said, what's a, what's a, great, what's a great example we just saw of how messaging in sports can really be interpreted differently. And by the way, mixed messages, right? So I was, I was thinking about the incident that happened last month with Aaron Boone. And for those of you who are not baseball fans, Aaron Boone is the current manager of the New York Yankees and uh, hit the home run back in 2003 uh, that cost the Red Sox an appearance in the World Series. But uh, luckily, we're long past the, that speaking of resiliency. And um, there was an incident last month where Aaron Boone uh, went out and uh, went off on this umpire who had only, it was only his fifth game in the majors, and he went off. And I, I actually went back and listened to the audio, and I want to break it down for our listeners so you can understand how many mixed messages and how many different pieces of communication Aaron Boone touched in this 20-second rant to the umpire. So he starts off in the conversation and he says, my guys are savages. Okay, now this was picked up on audio and Aaron Boone knew it would be picked up on audio. So my guys are savages. The first message out there is I'm going to defend my players. Okay, so he's advocating for his players. Then he says, you're having a terrible game. So now the umpire is being called out for incompetency, uh, an off day, it's whatever. And, and before I go any further, one of the things I talk about in communication in the workplace and even at home is in the beginning of a conversation, the second you put someone on the defensive by the word choice you use, by the tone you choose, or by your body language, you've lost because whatever outcome or whatever goal you wanted out of that conversation is not going to happen because when you put someone on the defensive, they're going to be so distracted and consumed by what you last said, they're not even going to hear anything else you said. So then he says, after you're having a terrible game, he says, I feel bad for you. So I feel bad for you. There's empathy mixed into all these messages. There's Aaron Boone saying, I feel bad for you. Now, whether the umpire thought that was authentic, genuine, who knows? But it was Aaron Boone's attempt at empathy. But right after he said, feel bad for you, in the same breath, he said, I feel bad for you, but you need to get better. And another mixed message in communication is when you start a sentence and then you say, but right after the sentence, 
everybody forgets what you said before the but, and they're totally focused on what comes after the but because it discredits and disqualifies your initial statement. So even if he was being empathetic authentically, it totally diminishes the good deed. Then he says, that guy is a good pitcher. So now he wants to make sure that in this rant that's caught on audio and video, he wants to make sure that he's not discrediting the other pitcher and taking away from the other pitcher's talent. I found that comment very interesting. In all his heated rant and anger, he actually was intelligent enough at that moment to call that out because the perception of the other team could be, why are you dogging my pitcher? Okay, so he did take that into consideration, for better or worse. But then again, here comes the butt again. That guy's a good pitcher, but our guys are savages. And he finishes by saying, tighten it up and tighten it up now, referring to the strike zone. So in that 20-second rant, you've got a mixture of empathy. You've got a mixture of giving credit to the other team. You've got advocating for your own team. You've got giving a demand and direct order to the umpire. And what you, what you unless you've seen the video, what, what I'm not talking about is body language. Aaron Boone was pointing his finger inches away from this umpire's face and yelling at him right in his face. So again, one of the things that gets confusing in communication is sometimes when leaders are communicating with someone and they pick the right words and they even say it with the right tone, but when the body language doesn't support the words and the tone, when one of those three things is missing, it doesn't work. And so a lot of times when people are in leadership positions and they try to do the right thing and it doesn't work and they've been taught a new habit or a new approach, or a new technique, and they come back to the teacher or the trainer and they say, well, see, I tried, it didn't work. And whenever I hear I tried, it didn't work, I say, are you sure you manage those four communication ingredients of tone, choice, body language, and listening? And invariably, it's always, no, okay, yeah, maybe I didn't do one or two of those that well. So, you know, as far as Aaron Boone goes, he knows, he's a smart guy, he's calculated, when he goes out, and does that rant, he's thinking of all the mixed messages he's putting out there. From the umpire's point of view, he could be making an enemy. I mean, you know, such a big problem in self-advocacy is so many people are afraid to speak up to a boss or a student to a teacher or a manager or player to an umpire because they think they're going to hold a grudge and they think it's going to impact the relationship moving forward. So when Aaron Boone went out to that umpire, he knew what he was doing. He was thinking to himself, You know, am I going to hold a grudge or am I going to set a precedent that says we're not going to be pushed around and we're watching your every move and if you short us or my players or the integrity of the game, I'm going to let you know and I'm going to point you out to be responsible. So he's taking a big risk there in how the umpire takes this. We don't know how the umpire is going to look at Aaron Boone and how he showed him up on national television. In the same way... An employee doesn't know if a leader's going to do that. A student doesn't know if a teacher's going to do that. And when I think about leadership, so much of that mixed message component creates the culture where people feel safe giving you that feedback without the risk, or more, not the risk, without the fear of repercussion that once they open that Pandora's box, What's going to happen? And, and I read a, a statistic online, actually, late last night that said 80% of employees surveyed say they're not comfortable giving feedback to their direct boss, even though they know, and it's well understood and talked about among their peers, that this boss has a specific weakness that could be overcome. So the second police of Aaron Boone is his players take away, right? His players love him. Right, I saw CC Sabathia, a Yankee, uh, and Brett Gardner spoke about how much that rant meant to them and how they felt stood up for and how they appreciated they didn't have to do it. And look, everybody likes being stood up for. I mean, who doesn't feel good when you're when you feel like you were treated poorly or unjustly and someone comes to your defense 
and stands up for you. I mean, that's big. I mean, everybody. So Aaron Boone, in that moment, he hasn't been manager for the Yankees a long time, but in that moment, if you're a player in that clubhouse and you had concerns about Aaron Boone's commitment to the team and standing up for the guys, he just got a lot of brownie points and a lot of commitment points when he stood up right there. So when I come back from our first break, we're going to continue to talk about mixed messages from the fans' takeaway, from ownership takeaway, and from other team takeaway. So this is Mark Altman with the Mindset Go Radio Show. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back to the Mindset Go Radio Show. Happy to have you back. And we are talking about mixed messages and setting precedents. And we're, if you're just joining us, we're talking about the uh, Aaron Boone rant on an umpire last month, an umpire who had only been umpiring for five games, and it was caught on uh, video and audio. Obviously, it was caught on video, but it was caught, his, his words were audioed uh, and, uh, with a mic, and we were able to hear exactly what he said. And um, I was talking about the mixed messages he's creating from how the umpires are going to perceive his message, how the, his own players are going to perceive this message. Now let's talk about the fans. Well, if you're a Yankee fan, you're, you're ecstatic. First of all, you're watching the game and you're feeling like you're being mistreated because if you feel like your f- players are being gypped because they're not getting the right calls, Aaron Boone's standing up for you too, right? So every Yankee fan in the world watching that game had to be in heaven in their glory watching Aaron Boone also represent them, right? So he knows he's getting the fans to buy in. Same thing with ownership, right? Ownership's bought in. He's representing his team. And then there's the other team, right? So the other team is seeing this, and they feel like, and we see this a lot in sports, when a coach, we see this in the NBA a lot, often when a coach during a playoff series will feel like a lot of calls, even in the NHL, when a lot of calls are going the wrong direction and we're two or three games into a playoff series, and a coach will put out there in the media that, you know, well, I don't know. It seems like the calls are very uneven. As a matter of fact, we saw the Blues coach just do this in the Stanley Cup against the Bruins. Craig Berube, he he came out, you know, a few games into the series, and he said, you know, we've had 14 penalties in the first two games, and we were the least penalized team in the NHL in the regular season. So how does that happen? So, you know, these coaches know the messages they're putting out in the media for fans to rile the fans and to put some kind of influence tactic out there to the officials and to the league to look a little closer at how their team is being treated. And really, essentially, that's what Aaron Boone did. And so when you look at how the other teams react when there's, an, we'll call it an influential leg up um, in competing in sports, You know, the other teams, if they're smart, um, it's on their radar, and they're thinking about how they're going to respond and how they're going to not only get the edge back, but at bare minimum, get back on equal footing. So how does this apply in leadership? You know, when, when you are having a conversation, and so much of what I enjoy doing at Mindset Go and training is talking about aspects of conversational intelligence emotional intelligence, and multi-generational intelligence. And the reason why, because every time you have a conversation with someone, you're, you're creating an impact. You're having an impact. You're either, someone, you're either building someone's confidence. You're validating who they are. You're helping them learn something new. You're taking away from them and adversely affecting their confidence level. You could be increasing their stress level. And you could be adding to some experiences they've had in the past, negative experiences, and you're just reinforcing their belief that why try because this is the reaction I'm always going to get. So every time, and it puts a lot of pressure on people, right? Because if you, if you stop and think and you say, wow, every time I have an interaction with another human being, I could be impacting something about that person. And then it feels like, well, that's heavy, that's stressful in itself. And in the translation of that in many cases is people feel like they have to walk on eggshells. That's, that's one of my favorite communication expressions, walking on eggshells. 
So if someone's ever said to you, I feel like I need to walk on eggshells around you, they're telling you a few things. Talking about mixed messages, they're telling you, first of all, they don't feel like they can be themselves. And that's a loud, loud, loud message. Because if someone tells you in any relationship, personal or professional, that you have, that they don't feel like if that's their way of telling you that they can't be themselves in front of you, that's a huge problem in itself. But in addition to telling you they can't be themselves, they feel like you're too hard on them, you're too critical, and they don't know how to communicate with you effectively. So the phrase walking on eggshells is heavy, and people might not always say it, but it, it, it has a lot of meaning. And even if they're not saying it, how do you know if people trust they can be themselves with you? How do they know they can truly communicate with you? And here's an example. The next time Aaron Boone walks to the mound, or excuse me, walks to see an umpire to complain, even before he gets into his body language and his gyrations, how are they going to react to him moving forward? The specific umpire in question, if he sees Aaron Boone coming to approach him, is he going to sit there and go, oh, I remember that guy. That's the guy who made me look like a fool on national television. How about the, the peers of that umpire? Is now the next time Aaron Boone gonna, is going to come to complain to any umpire, are they going to hold that against him because they made one of their peer, one of his peers look bad on one of their peers look bad on national television. So he set that precedent. Aaron Boone has now set that precedent and he has put a big risk out there. Now, one of the interesting things when you talk about mixed messages and how people communicate with one another, sometimes when people make bad decisions in how they communicate, if the person feels like the person who made the decisions is justified, so for instance, in this case, if Aaron Boone communicated poorly, but the reason he communicated poorly is justified because, boy, when that umpire goes back and looks at the video and he says, geez, I really had a bad game. I can see why he would have been upset. Well, maybe he does that. So it, the, 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 the accountability aspect is a major piece right, of communication because if you, even if you feel like someone's treated you poorly or unjustly, and if you can, in an unbiased fashion, go back Look at what happened. Now, this is on video, so obviously it's easy for the umpire to go check his own work. But what do you do if it's not on video? What if you do if you just had an interaction where you were treated with, you know, your boss just came down hard on you on certain things, and you're so caught up in, I can't believe he's treating me or she's treating me like that. And, you know, I didn't deserve that. Well, if you remember what I said earlier in the show, that the second you're put on the defensive, you know, you get distracted from listening to else any, anybody else says, well, here's the problem. How you treat people, regardless of whether you're justified in being frustrated, whether you have an important point to make, emotion to share, thought to express, becomes irrelevant by the way you communicate it. So Aaron Boone might have some fences to mend with the umpires. He might not. Maybe the umpire and maybe Aaron Boone and the umpire, for all we know, have talked privately and worked it out. I don't know. But he now has some fences to mend. And so when you talk about why things don't work in communication, and sometimes when a leader comes back to me and says, Well, I did what you said and it didn't work, and I talk about those four ingredients I mentioned earlier, the reason why I bring that up is because it stops being about whether you were right or just. Because being right and just and having something important to teach people is good, but if you can't do it the right way, it doesn't matter. It's not going to get through in most cases. And so we get caught up. I had, I had someone say to me one time, um, talking about relationships, and they said, would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? And my answer was, I'd rather be both. Because to me, not from an ego or pride perspective, I do want to know if I'm right. I, I like to uh, be challenged. I like to have conversations with people where we share opinions and really can have some 
respectful and meaningful and purposeful conversations to know, hey, is this the right direction? Is this the right approach? Is this the right way to communicate with someone? So I like it. But the way to be happy, that's where the emotional intelligence comes in. When I'm having that communication with whatever person I'm having it, am I self-aware in that moment of what I want the outcome of that conversation to be and what's going to get in the way of that outcome in my communication style? Am I in control of how I'm going to react? Have I taken the time to anticipate how I think the person's going to respond to this? Even when I communicate it in the best possible way possible, are they going to get defensive? Have we had negative interactions in the past that they're going to immediately gravitate to and remember and it's going to distract them from the conversation? Do they have the aptitude to even hear this message? Have they had bad experiences with other managers that could impact my message, even if I have a great relationship with that person? So those are all key factors. And then comes, are they motivated to do anything different? You know, have they discovered how it would help them? Have you made the why clear? Do they have intrinsic motivation? Have I expressed empathy that even if I'm disappointed and even if I'm frustra- frustrated and even if it's been done repeatedly, can I still show empathy even if persons, I've had to go back time and time again to talk about the same thing with this person. Just like Aaron Boone says, I feel bad for you. But if I feel bad for you is mixed into all kinds of negative communication, it gets lost. And then finally, the perception. What is the perception the person's going to have, the people are going to have who I'm talking with, who I'm having the conversation with, before when the conversation starts, during, what are they thinking in that conversation? Are they being mindful and are they being present? And after, what do they walk away from the conversation thinking about me, thinking about the topic, thinking about how I communicate? All those factors are extremely relevant. So when we come back after the break, we're going to continue this conversation and we're going to talk about, we're going to transition mixed messages to things like setting precedence and how to build a track record. So I'm Mark Altman for the Mindset Go Radio Show. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back to the Mindset Go Radio Show. I'm Mark Altman here with you on a Thursday afternoon. And uh, we've been talking about uh, one of my favorite passions, which is sports, and tying it in how it ties into communication with leadership and in your, in your lives, personally and professionally. And one of the things that I find interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things I find interesting in sports, you know, we've been talking about mixed messages, but now we're going to kind of transition to setting precedence a little bit. And one of the funny words we hear a lot in sports is complacency right? Such a challenge in sports with emotional intelligence is how to keep motivating people. And you know, we hear it most right now with Tom Brady. You hear his teammates saying all the time, how does this guy still get so fired up and so motivated at his age? And let's forget his age. Let's throw his age out the window. He's won six Super Bowls. He's been to nine. So how does a guy who has a beautiful wife, a beautiful family, adoring fan base. I mean, in the last year, even even his his opponents are coming out left and right saying how much they have respect for him in most cases. So here's a guy who has mastered motivation. How has he done it? And in sports, that's always the challenge. When people reach the pinnacle, whether it's statistics, and you take guys like Russell Westbrook and James Harden in the NBA – who are so statistically driven. And if you're fans of theirs and you're angry when you hear that, my response is, look, they're getting the triple doubles, they're getting the 50 points, and they haven't won. And maybe they haven't had the right teammates, maybe they're not the right leaders, I don't know. But they seem statistically driven because that's always what they talk about and what's talked about. Okay? So how do guys who excel statistically... How do guys that excel in a team-oriented way in winning championships, how does someone stay motivated when they've achieved the pinnacle of their profession, even if it's for only one year? I mean, Mookie Betts just hit three home runs in a game for his fifth time in his career. This is a really young player. 
And and sometimes I think we can lose perspective. Five times hitting three home runs in a game. It's crazy. So motivation. So now let's apply that to leadership for a moment. How do you have someone who is the poster child for awesomeness in your organization? Their staff loves them. The executive team loves this leader. They're doing everything that's asked, but you want more. How does someone who gets good performance reviews, adored by their peers, up, down, and sideways, how do you go to that person and say, there's more for you. There's more to learn. There's more to get better. Right? And the best example, frankly, over sports or leadership is sales. Because salespeople typically have a milestone or objectives that they want to get to hopefully it's not driven by company quotas and it's self-driven, but for the purpose of this conversation, you know, do I want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year? Do I want to make 150, 200? What's the number? And when I get to that number, then what? Sustain it or grow from it. And there's always a number people have where you make that decision. You're making a conscious decision in that moment. Is that good enough? Am I happy sustaining it? Do I want to get better? Or how about this? You know what? I like making $200,000 a year, but I'd still be pretty happy making one twenty-five dollars or one fifty. dollars so I don't think I'm going to put in as much time. Think about that for a minute. There's three possible decisions that can be made by that salesperson. Do I want more? Do I want to sustain it where, I at, where I'm at? Or do I want to, what I perceive as work less, and not as hard, still make a pretty good amount of money, but not have to work as hard. One of those three decisions is being made every day, all the time, by your salespeople. So how do you motivate them? How do you make sure they're not getting complacent? And frankly, I've talked about this on the past radio shows. We have such, talk about setting precedents and track records. We have such a doubt universally about salespeople motivating themselves that we have to structure their compensation with commission. So we're basically saying, you know what? All other professions, don't worry about it. We know you're going to stay motivated. But salespeople, we're not so sure. We better give you some carrots to dangle. We better give you some President's Club's vacation and uh, some bonuses and incentives and maybe profit sharing. I don't know. But we basically are saying we just, we're worried that salespeople are either A, going to get complacent or B, motivate or lack motivation. And frankly, I was speaking to a former salesperson I trained the other day, um, who's now working for a a multi-million dollar, multi-hundred million dollar company. And he called me up and he says to me, he says, you know, I just sold a $45 million deal. And as a result of that sale, my boss said, your your quota is now, instead of $8 million a year, it's $43 million a year. And I found that to be very interesting because my takeaway from that was, well, the the boss, the, the message, the boss is giving, well, if you can sell $45 million a year, obviously your quota is too low. So now the salesperson set a precedent And you could argue the mixed message there is, am I getting punished because now my job just get harder and to make more money just get harder after I just did something amazing? That could be the perception of the salesperson. But the leadership, we don't know what the message the leader is sending there, but the leader might say, if they were there to defend themselves, the sales VP might say, no, you've shown you have the aptitude and potential to do great things and we're going to raise your quota to challenge you to reach for even higher levels. I mean, who knows? But that's what emotional intelligence is all about, right? It's the, it's the social skills, it's the mixed messages that go with perception, that go with motivation. So we don't want complacency, right? So we're doing whatever we can to motivate people. And a lot of what we're hearing with some of the younger generations in the, in the workplace is the perception is from some of the older generations is that they struggle to be motivated and that they, they have to have a sense of purpose or a sense of passion to be motivated. 
But motivation has always been an enormous challenge. Can your leaders motivate their teams? Ask yourself that. If you are a leader, ask yourself, am I good at motivating my team? And if you're answering yes, what do you do that makes you think you're good at motivating your team? Because a lot of managers will talk about the relationships they have with their team and how tight they are and how much respect, mutual respect, which is phenomenal. It's great. But how do you know that you are truly motivating your team? And if you feel like that's a weakness in your ability to lead, how do you learn that? How do you get better? Because it all starts with motivation. And when it comes to battling complacency, it's a tall order. I mean, I I know even as a parent, you know, I'm very cautious if my par- if my children have done something really well. I even think about how much of a big deal I want to make because I certainly want to celebrate them, and I certainly want them to feel really confident. But I'm actually more about having my kids develop processes and habits to sustain their confidence as opposed to celebrating their outcomes. But my point being is, if, if, my, if my youngest son gets off the basketball court and he scores 20 points, I'm like, oh, that was amazing, great job, I knew you had it in you. Now I start to worry, and I coach too, now I start to worry, well, wait a minute, now is he satisfied with that? Now does he feel like, hey, I, I'm great, I got my 20 points. Maybe I don't have to work as hard. Now I've gotten the approval of my parents, of the coaches. Am I going to still be motivated to get better? It's an important question, and it's a tough question to answer. But I am measured in how I respond, knowing that people are motivated differently, and sometimes too much positive feedback can cause complacency. And that's why what makes communication so complex is... You have to communicate different ways with different people. The way you truly motivate your team and individuals is knowing who they are, what triggers them, what their goals are, what their intrinsic motivators are. Because if you don't have that kind of information, you could have complacency set in and it can make it very difficult. When we come back for our final segment, I want to talk a little bit more of how to create a positive track record and spinning off those precedents that you're afraid to set into a positive track record. This is Mark Altman for the Mindset Go Radio Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the final segment of the Mindset Go Radio Show. I hope you are all using mindfulness in your day-to-day to practice new habits and to look and seek to make incremental improvements and using it for resiliency using it to develop new skills, using it to increase your knowledge, and using it just to be present and understand what's going on in your life currently, what's going on around you, knowing how to sense and understand your emotions. And mindfulness and emotional intelligence are such critical aspects of of life. So, some final thoughts today as we're talking about setting precedents. Sometimes when leaders are in a position to do something, and I always come back to, I'm going to give you a really simple example. And I just, I, I, not only do I love this example, but I just had someone in a restaurant handle this with A-plus level success the other day. So the example is, talking about setting precedence, you go into a restaurant, and I'm a really picky eater, and I say I want my dinner Uh, delivered in a certain way. I said, I don't want this. I do want this, so on and so forth. And the waiter or waitress in that moment has three options, right? They can say, sure, no problem. They can say, no, I can't do it. Actually, there's four options. They could say, let me check. Or they can say, we can do it, but I can't always promise you we'll be able to do it due to a multitude of reasons. I just don't want you to expect this as a given. And that last reason is so important because if you don't say that, then if someone does something for me one time, then every time I go back to that restaurant, I'm going to expect it can be done again. And for our listeners out there, I'm sure you have to agree because instinctively, 
someone does something for you and then the next time they say no, you're like, well, you did it last time. What's different this time? So think of the different challenges leaders have to face when their staff is coming to them on a daily basis making requests. And do I set a precedent? If I let one person go home early, I need to let everybody go home early. If I let one person show up late once a week because they have a personal conflict at home, now what am I going to say to everybody else? And I think one of the interesting things when you're setting precedents in the workplace is to understand why you're setting the precedent, but also understand what are the consequences? Because I think a lot of times it works both ways, right? So if you don't want to set a precedent because you're afraid of the consequences, understand what your options are, okay? If you're letting someone come in 15 minutes late once a week, and I'm just going to use that as an example, that's a dangerous precedent to set because you're opening the door to other people wanting to ask. Where I think, where I think it becomes dangerous is if you don't address it to the team. And that's where precedent setting becomes a big problem. It's not just if I do this, I can assume that everybody else is going to ask. Or if I do this, I'm opening up a door that I don't want to open up. It's communication. So what I would do in a situation like that is if I'm giving permission to that person, I would call the team together or depending on if your team's virtual or how big the team are, and I would say, listen, so-and-so has made a specific request for me that I've determined to be valid for a multitude of reasons. So I'm going to let them come in 15 minutes late once a week. I don't want you to assume that this gives everybody permission to do that. And before it gets to curiosity, my point in bringing this up to you is if you do have any specific concerns or needs that you need to talk to me about, um, please feel free to approach me and I will make decisions accordingly based on what I think is appropriate and what isn't. So calling out that you made the decision, you had your reasons for making the decision, opening the door for future requests and communication like that, not guaranteeing the outcome, not feeling obligated to accede to everybody's wishes and do what everybody wants just because you let that one person come in 15 minutes late. So I think it's important you know, we have rules for a reason. We have policies for a reason. And my thought process are, is there's always gray areas, right? Don't think we ever want to get in the habit of black and white unless it's a safety-related issue or unless there's a mitigating circumstance. But I think we want to be open-minded even when policies are put in place, even when rules are put in place, because often in those cases, those are policies and rules that have been long-standing for God knows how long They were put in place long before you got there. So for people to make requests, be supported, I think is an important part in setting precedences and setting precedence. And if you're a leader and you're backing away because you open up a door, you don't have to look at it that you're opening up a door and it could broaden a bigger conversation. And my final thought on this today is, The best example I can make is uh, one of the programs we do is a high school orientation for eighth graders where we help kids feel more comfortable um, coping and dealing with the things that they're going to encounter in high school. So we do a a 90-minute program where we role play different issues and they participate and demonstrate different issues that they would be worried about heading into high school. And we talk through different um, strategies and techniques so they can know how to deal with them come high school. And so the idea is one of the examples we role played or one of the challenges kids could have is that a curfew. So parents not trusting their kids, they have a certain curfew, the kids want a later curfew. And so we talked through one of these examples and the child said that um, the issue with the curfew wasn't that the parent didn't trust her, it was that the parent didn't trust the other kids who she would be hanging out with. So here's the analogy I'm trying to make. That opens up a broader parent-child discussion where it seems like the conversation's about curfew when it has nothing to do with curfew. It has everything to do with decisions your children make, the trust of the kids that they're associating themselves with, and their um, tendency to be impressionable 
by people that will encourage them to make this bad decisions. That's a great conversation for a parent and child. It wasn't about curfew. It's about the three things I just said. And in the workplace, if you shy away from conversations where people have needs, they want to be supported, they want to feel like they can come to you, and you shy away from having those conversations, or not even shy away from the conversations, you shy away from the consequences of those conversations, you're missing a golden opportunity to really empower and energize your team and talk about bigger picture things, about why you make decisions, why you can okay some things and not others, but ultimately why you want to create an open and honest communication environment. So I think it's very important for leaders to look at the root cause of these issues and understand what's the big picture and could that be an empowering or a conversation to have. With that said, my time is up for today. I will look forward to seeing you next Thursday. Once again, my name is Mark Altman. This is the Mindset Go Radio Show. A special thanks to Ted, our producer. And uh, please stay tuned for the Frankie Boyer Show. And if you have any other questions, would like to talk to Mindset Go about training, consulting, doing a, a, an assessment or an evaluation for your company, uh, please reach out to MindsetGo.com or email at info at MindsetGo.com. Have a great Thursday afternoon. We'll see you next time.